Great to be with everyone today. Uh, thanks for spending some of your time this afternoon with us. Um, again, Mike McGinley uh, at DIU. And uh, want to cover, uh, if nothing else, two main things today uh, about the Defense Innovation Unit. The first is that it's working. Uh, we've been out this now for about five years, and I think you, you will see uh, we've really met with some great success. And more importantly, uh, we're gonna talk about today about how do we get DIU to work for you? That's why you're here. Uh, and so uh, hopefully this will be fun and enjoyable for you. We're gonna give you a little bit of a peek under the hood and you'll get a chance to see, okay, why do we work the way we do? What are we trying to do? And then how does our process flow? And when you understand that, it gives you a better chance to compete uh, and engage with us. Uh, we'll also take a look at uh, three specific companies uh, who have done uh, follow the process uh, to great success. So you get a sense of, is, you know, people always ask, is this real or is this not? And I think when you get a chance to, to see uh, the outcome, uh, I think you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised. So, Johanna, with that, uh, can you hit the uh, next slide, please? All right, so the, if you think about the, what uh, the DIU mission is, right? So Johanna touched on this uh, briefly before, Tripartite, we have three parts. We're here to accelerate uh, the DOD adoption of commercial technology, that's key. And, and we talk about that as a unique focus of ours uh, in the Department of Defense. We are exclusively focused on getting that existing commercial technology and bringing it in. Second is, we're looking to be transformative. How do we transform uh, military capability uh, in a way that um, is meaningful? So we often talk about this in a 10X uh, improvement. And the third is, how do we strengthen the national security innovation base? And this is really where you come in. So we understand uh, that it takes a, a large group of people in a community to uh, be able to participate and successfully uh, work on shared interests of national security. So those are the three missions of DIU. I think it's, it's, it's worth uh, noting here, if you look at the, the, the top part of this, which is we're fast moving and cross DOD organization. Fast moving is critical. As you know, and the speed of business, it's the only way to operate. In fact, this was uh, really foot stomped in the 2018 National Defense Strategy that talked about performance at the speed of relevance. And we take that to heart. The second is that we're a cross DOD organization. So rather than focus on a specific service, we're thinking comprehensively across the entire Department of Defense. That means every one of the military services, every one of the 11 combatant commands, and every one of the agencies and we call the fourth estate. So those are agencies um, that you, any part of the, uh, the government uh, or Department of Defense uh, who falls outside of the first two. So we have a very uh, unique mission and that's cross DOD and uh, we are focused exclusively on commercial. And you put those together, you have a very unique uh, uh, result. So next slide, please. If you look at it, why we do what we do, right? So we're, why are we focused on commercial? I think this slide does a really nice job of explaining that. And on the left, let's start with the, uh, you know, the Y commercial and take a look at the, the, the column graph. And you can see a comparison here of the top tech companies uh, and their research and development spend against uh, the, uh, the top uh, defense companies and their research and development spend. And the message here is not that we're gonna work, not work with our uh, uh, traditional defense uh, contractors, but that there is so much power and potential in the private sector. Right? And that's why this is such an exciting field to be in. Look at the, right, uh, the, the line graph on the right-hand side. You can see sometime in the, you know, it looks like the mid-80s, those lines diverge. And those lines represent the difference between, uh, one is the commercial R&D spend, and the other is the federal research and development spend. And if you take those lines as a proxy for innovation, you can understand why we're so excited uh, to be able to focus on commercial technology, because that is driving so much of our innovation today. So if we're engaging with you, if we understand the types of technology that you're bringing to bear, that makes a massive difference for us, right? Uh, so next slide, we'll get into a little bit more of DIU's role in this ecosystem, which essentially, if you think about it, is as a market maker. So you can see here uh, where we act as a bridge between the Department of Defense and uh, the demand signal and commercial companies and industry and that we consider the supply side. So we broker deals. Our focus, just so everyone is tracking, is primarily to develop prototypes. Right? So we're gonna to look to develop prototypes, then we're gonna to try to transition those prototypes, meaning 
outside of organizations, send it back into, uh, into the rest of the Department of Defense, and then scale them. And I think that, you know, one of the things I hope we get a chance to talk about in this discussion afterward is, is we are so focused on scale. Again, because we're not focused or limited to any one service, we are thinking comprehensively across the entire department. So if you have technology that you are bringing to bear, my advice that I've always given to companies is take a step back and think about it. Rather than get fixated on a specific organization or sub-organization who might be interested, sit back and think, is there another organization or service across the entire department who might also benefit uh, from my technology? And DIU is uniquely positioned because we're sitting in the office of the Secretary of Defense to get you there, right, to make that, those bridging functions. So why do we do this? Uh, you can see in the top, why do we, what do we offer to the Department of Defense? Uh, we give DOD access to leading commercial technology. Again, not news to you, uh, but this is what the focus that um, really before DIU, uh, it was hard for the department to get that commercial tech in and get it in quickly in a way that could be used by warfighters uh, or on the national security establishment quickly. So you can see here, we have a focus on delivery capabilities in 12 to 24 months. And this is important because people always say, hey, are you, I have a great idea for something in national security. You know, I've, I've just started developing, it may take five plus years, what do you think? And our answer is like, our mission is, can the technology get, uh, be delivered in about two years or less? So hopefully that gives you some sense of the development and the maturity of the technology we're seeking. Uh, we can also get uh, solutions at your commercial cost curves, which is uh, incredibly important. It can drive down costs for everyone uh, and which you appreciate probably as a, uh, as a US taxpayer. So what do we offer you? Key here is simple process and faster time to award. It goes without saying, uh, generally if people think about working with the Department of Defense, easy is not a, um, a word that would spring to mind if you're thinking about, should I do this? Importantly, we found, and it was important on our premise uh, of our creation was the investment community, people in charge and holding on to risk capital were loath to uh, engage with companies who had a defense focus for working because they were aware of the bureaucracy. They are aware of the long lead times and it just wasn't a good use of their money. So what we've been able to do, uh, and this takes time to do it, we're, we're certainly not at their end goal yet, but we've been able to change that dialogue and change that perception so that DIU, DIU money becomes smart money. So an investor who uh, is engaged in a DIU related project says, yeah, this is good stuff. I'm willing to, uh, to take a risk here, provide more capital because I now understand there's a larger total addressable market and one I otherwise would not have been able to access. Again, you have access to a large volume of DOD contact, uh, contracts. Um, and for many people, it's the opportunity to work on a, on a problem that matters. You are working on problems of, of national security. I've already told you that it, we focus on transformative projects. These things all come together and it's a mission that, uh, that uh, you can get behind and feel good about. Um, and then you can also get us, uh, we serve as a uh, dedicated uh, uh, product manager to liaise with DOD partners. And uh, another thing I think we'll, we'll give you a peek under the hood here, it's more nuanced when people think about working with the DOD than just working with one specific organization. If you really want to be successful, and here's the tip that people don't tell you about in the beginning, you have to really move in parallel across three different levels, and we'll talk to you about those levels in a little bit. Uh, next slide, please, Joanna. All right, so when we want to think about this of how do we compare a traditional uh, to a traditional uh, federal acquisition regulation based contract, because that's what most people know. And this, this slide um, I show because it does a really nice job of comparing and contrasting the two. The top is incredibly important. Many of you, if you've worked with the Department of Defense before, are, you know and you understand just the massive amount of requirements that come out. It's very specific. And what that is tantamount to is me telling you how to build and how to address and solve my problem. Now, there are certain things that I'm aware of uh, that may drive uh, the type of technology that comes, into uh, comes to bear, but DIU takes a very different approach. And if you look at the word requirement on the left and problem on the right, first glance, it doesn't make much of a difference, but it's huge. And the difference is what I'm going to put on our website, and we'll walk through specifics of the process next, is here's the problem that we are trying to solve. Can you help us? 
changes everything because now what it puts you in the position to do is understanding your resource, understanding the technology better than we could ever hope to do. You will tell us a creative solution probably that we've never even thought of or considered that will meet our problem. Next is timing. We'll talk more about this, but we move very, very quickly. Uh, and we've been going you know, even more quickly now than we have in the past. The next three uh, lines you can see on the right-hand side for DIU, negotiable, negotiable, negotiable. That should be exciting for you because what that means is you will have a chance to engage with us uh, on a one-to-one, -one, you know, if you are chosen, if you make it that far in our process, to think about how is this going to look? What are the milestones going to look like? How do we handle negotiable IP and data rights? Harken back to the, one of the first things we talked about in our, our three-part mission. The third uh, part of that is to grow and strengthen the national security innovation base. That's our mindset. So if I know that, and you know that going in, when we talk about IP, I know for me to be successful in my mission, I need you to succeed as a company, right? So already you're taking down some of the traditional barriers of the very adversarial nature, and you're thinking, okay, how do we collaborate? How do we work together to get to a situation that gives me the technology that I need to accomplish my mission, but also ensures your success or helps your success, right, uh, as a company? And I just wanted to point that out. Uh, the last part here is uh, sole source for, uh, is justified for production versus sole source is difficult. We're going to get to this and why this is so important, because for you, it shows, hey, there's a, a, a pot at the end of the rainbow. Uh, if it goes well and your technology works, uh, as everyone hopes, uh, there is a chance for significant upside. And I'm going to have a couple examples for you uh, in a few. Johanna, next slide, please. So here's again a peek under the hood at our process. Uh, we keep it simple on purpose. But if you look at this, uh, I think it will uh, make some things clear to you. That first part that we talked about is that problem curation. We start a DIU project when it comes in, um, this is generally, so there are exceptions, but by and large, when it comes in from an organization in the DOD who says, hey Mike, I have a problem that I need to solve, right? This could be any service, um, any combatant commands, any end user, it doesn't matter. And we say, let's talk about that, right? So we're gonna take in and we're gonna field those initial problem statements and we're gonna work with them, we're gonna curate and understand uh, really what they're trying to do. However, we're gonna reach out as well into the commercial sector to say, okay, um, how would you help us refine this? Does this make sense? You're the expert out here. Do we, is, are we even asking the right problem? Because frequently that's the case is, we might be asking the wrong problem. You're gonna be best positioned to tell us that. So in this diligence phase, we're gonna check a look and see, does it, a commercial market exist um, that is established enough to really carry this project? Again, we're not looking for science experiments or very basic research here. We have labs that are doing great jobs at that. What I really want to focus on are in our projects and technologies that I can get to a prototype in about a year, and then I can get to the field in about two years. And you'll hear me say this again and again and again, because it helps you get a sense of where are you in your product cycle and when could you engage. The third part here is the CSO, commercial solution, uh, solutions opening. This is where we open it up. Uh, we have now distilled the problem statement to about two or three paragraphs. We put it on our website, which you should uh, know it's just diu.mil. Uh, it's on there uh, and we open it up for the world uh, to uh, provide uh, proposals on a merit-based pro uh, process. What I can tell you is that these have become incredibly competitive. Uh, people are, are aware uh, that they're up there. Everyone is checking the website and we're getting very, very strong proposals that are coming in. What are we looking for? essentially a five page white paper or a 15 slide PowerPoint deck, that's it. So again, if we wanna grow that national security innovation base, it is incumbent upon us to keep that barrier to entry as low as possible. So we're not a consortium, there's no cost to use us. When a solicitation is on our website, all you have to do is respond uh, using that format. It's very, very simple. And again, you should be responding to uh, a problem statement that's two or three paragraphs long uh, in terms that hopefully you can understand. Once a contract is awarded, we're gonna to move to prototyping, uh, which is a chance to actually develop that uh, and integrate um, that into uh, a pilot project. So again, the timing there is about one year. And ultimately, uh, if that project uh, proves successful, what DIU will help you do is transition your project out to the rest of the Department of Defense, perhaps even the rest of the federal government, and then look to scale that across. Again, a, a great success for us is deemed one that not only launches, but then can be used and accessed by everyone else across the federal government, which is 
obviously a big win for you if, if we can do that. So that's, again, in, in a nutshell, our process. Uh, let's now move on to a specific example of how this could look in a timeline. Uh, and we put this timeline together to give you a very concrete example. If we started today, right, and we post a solicitation, really, what does this look like? And you can see here, just to get a, a timeline, between now and September, the way that this would work. So we posted our solicitation today. Uh, on the 9th of July, the solicitation closes. At that point, we're going to say, okay, we're going to uh, do a review of the companies and uh, grade and score them. We'll invite, uh, we'll select a few to say, okay, come in now to pitch uh, and do that. Uh, we'll do it virtually these days uh, and make a down select. Uh, and then of those who've been down selected again, we now have what we call the RPP. We'll reach out and say, okay, um, uh, uh, tell us your proposals. Uh, we receive those uh, and then ultimately move down to a statement of work where we finally uh, negotiate the terms. So if you think about we have a, a giant pool at the first stage uh, of people who make submissions, then we do a cut uh, and then we move down to a smaller uh, uh, down select and then we ultimately go to a statement of work and award a contract. Uh, we've been averaging at least in 2019 last year it was 127 days. Our goal is 60 to 90 days uh, and we've been moving very, very quickly this year to, toward that goal. So you can see how this works. It's very simple. We've aimed, our aim is to make it as easy as possible for companies who want to work with us uh, and as fast as possible. And if you're not gonna get a select, we'll send you a non-select letter, uh, again, very rapidly, so you know you're not waiting and waiting and waiting to determine if this is going to be uh, a revenue stream for you or not. All right, so now we're gonna move into what we call the, the five factors, elements of a successful defense innovation unit project. Number one, a funded DAU, uh, DOD priority. And this is important. So uh, it's, it's, companies always say, hey, should I send you my proposals? And uh, we get flooded with them. What you need to understand is there's the demand signal and the funding is gonna come from anywhere outside of DIU, one of our DOD partners. So when they are ready to take a project and move forward, they approach us and we have very strong relationships with them. And they say, look, hey, uh, DIU, we'd like to run a project with you. And that's really what starts this. And the key there and why this is so important for you is that when they do that, they're coming with money. So ideally uh, that funding will come in and we're not gonna start a project until we have secured that. What does that mean for you? Rather than having to, you know, uh, we talk, we have a conversation, we ham and haw, and then we think we got a deal and I, then I have to tell you we have no money. This is different. Now you know when you deal with the Defense Innovation Unit, you're gonna be dealing with a funded project. So you have a great sense of confidence about doing business with the government and that the money is already on hand versus getting pushed out because somebody changed uh, commanders or um, nobody asked for the money. And by the way, it's a two year cycle, uh, which tends to surprise people uh, on, a, uh, on a constant basis. So again, we already talked about this solves problems and not requirements. That's all the first factor. The second is, is a commercial solution available? And I mentioned this before, I wanna find a viable commercial solution that exists today. If we can find a company that's venture backed, that's even better because that shows increased uh, uh, R&D, uh, money towards R&D that will go in there that the DOD doesn't have to fund. It's not required, but it's something we like to see. Uh, and we also hope that now that more companies are being successful working with DIU, more venture, uh, venture firms are engaged in tracking that. So that working with us can actually attract venture capital, which is a, a great spillover benefit. Uh, we are not looking to build defense contractors or to make companies uh, become defense contractors. So we want you to, be able to keep your commercial, uh, existing commercial business. And that's important to us as well. Third factor is, is it transformative? I don't want something that's five or 10% better. I want something that's 10 X better. I'm thinking number one in performance is going to make a difference to the mission. I'm also gonna consider, does it make a difference in schedule or cost or, or cost improvement? Those are all things that I'm gonna consider here uh, because if I don't, you know, we could get roughed up in small, smaller projects. So DIU is really focused on those transformative things. And so important here, again, recall where we are. We are in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. We've gotta think about scaling across the DOD. It's good for me and it's great for you. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Four and five are my time bound factors, right? So, can I get to a prototype um, really within a year? I mean, 24 months if it's, if it's hardware or space intensive, but I need to get to a prototype within a year and I need to be able to think through how I'm going to ultimately transition this uh, in about two years plus. 
uh, is maybe a year and a half ago, we had the uh, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff come into the office in Cambridge and he sat down and I'm telling you, this was the ask, go do, I need to get stuff out into the field quickly. So it's, it's clear where we play our role in the ecosystem and that should be hopefully clear to you. So you can take a look at the maturity of your own technology and say, does it fit? People also come up and ask and say, look, I am very, pretty mature right now. I might have to adapt or adjust my technology to work with you, but I feel pretty confident. Is that okay? And the answer is absolutely yes, right? That is fine. Um, usually when people work with us or companies work with us, there needs to be some um, you know, change uh, to the technology, but that's completely fine. So that's uh, hopefully give you an idea of, of how that all works. Uh, we will work with you and talk about uh, the transition plan from really from the beginning of when that contract is awarded. And that's key. Because if you don't think long term, you ultimately won't scale. And what you end up with is either innovation theater or you're going to get a great prototype and it may be uh, the absolute thing that you created. You're proud of it. We're proud of it but there's no plan to actually move that into a program of record or get that into the field, right? And so this is something that DIU does very, very well and we are focused on. Um, and this requires us to work across several different layers of organizations, which we'll talk about now. Uh, Johanna, next slide, please. Thanks. So three big important partners in the DOD. Again, this is one of those uh, tips and tricks that no one ever talks about because people talk about doing business and it's generally viewed as, as a one point to one point yeah, I'm going to work with the DOD. And there's no sense that the DOD is very nuanced, very complicated. It's Byzantine. How do you really engage? DIU, as we talked about earlier, is going to be that market maker for you, your river guide to help you focus on understanding. There's a difference in the role that a headquarters organization plays, an acquisition organization plays, and an end user plays, right? So all three of them have different roles. We're going to help you engage across each of those uh, because if you don't do them in parallel, chances are you're going to get stuck. If you don't hit the headquarters and you hope to get an authority to operate, even if you may have the winning solution, you might find you're waiting for several years. If you haven't talked to the right PEO, that's a program executive office, or had someone in the acquisition community talk about this, chances are you have no chance in getting through full lifecycle management. And you haven't had a long-term uh, uh, funding uh, stream for your, uh, for your technology or your process. And the third is end users. If you haven't talked to them, if you haven't kept them engaged, uh, you're out of luck. And I think that the, uh, the, the world has changed, especially over the last few years, where that constant user input uh, and DevOps mindset is more important than ever. Next slide. We talked a little bit about our, our five portfolios here. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, you can see here our five portfolios are listed. So very, very broad. Uh, we chose those areas because these are areas where commercial technology has taken great leaps uh, and many strides ahead uh, and where the Department of Defense has great interest. Again, we have very, very bright people working within the Department of Defense who are working in these areas. So this is a chance for us to still work together, but to make sure we're tracking the latest in commercial technology and we're bringing it into the DOD. So we can talk more about this later if you have specific questions, but I wanted to show these just so you could get a sense of the actual breadth uh, that, uh, that DIU brings. And while I'm at it, I, I should have mentioned this before, DIU has, uh, is based in Silicon Valley. Uh, we have offices in Boston, in Austin, Texas, and the Pentagon. Uh, now we're almost completely virtual, right? So it doesn't matter. But just to give you that sense is that uh, we are one DIU. We, there's no separate what one office works on versus another. We are rather organized around these portfolios that are illustrated here. So. That as, uh, as foundation context, what I would like to do is show you three examples of companies uh, who have worked with DIU and how that's turned out for them. First company, uh, we think about robotics and drones. And what I wanted to do, uh, show you here was give you a sense of before the engagement with DIU and afterwards, right? So this is some good news stuff. Like this is exactly the way that this is supposed to work out. We are really proud to be able to share this with you and hope this gets you excited about it too. So here we have a company founded in 2015, Angelback, okay? So this is uh, small stuff. First time DOD contract and they're listed and we consider them a small non-traditional. They got a less than about a half a million dollar prototype award, but a $46 million follow on production contract that was awarded in less than 18 months, right? And now we're looking to transition to the Navy. So. Again, if you think about this, how this works, it's a very simple process. 
It doesn't require um, anything or very little uh, engagement uh, on your part, certainly no uh, additional cost, just whatever it takes for you to put your proposal together in, in 10 days or so. But this is a game and life changing event. And I would show, just to kind of pause here, and it, it will be the same as we go through. That award does a couple of things. One is a massive boost to, uh, to this company uh, in general, uh, will also drive further research and development, but then it also attracts additional funding and venture funding, right? And that's important. So this becomes an accretive cycle, right? A rising tide lifts all boats that benefits the government, uh, it benefits the uh, risk capital community, and certainly benefits the company. So let's go to uh, example number two. This is a cyber threat intelligence company. Again, yeah, founded in 2009, uh, they did. They were private equity backed, uh, so they had some some great R&D. They were awarded a million and a half for prototype funding, and then uh, they were awarded in September 2019. So this is all recent stuff. A 50 million dollar follow-on contract, and, uh, and perhaps better yet, a transition to U.S. Cyber Command. So again, you're showing that the the product not only is able to move from prototype into production very very quickly through DIU. Now you have a customer. If this works very well, what you've established is a massive addressable market. You've established a massive amount of credibility and you've communicated that to the rest of the community and the commercial market. So there again, there's a spillover benefit for DOD centered work that has direct commercial application. Again, it, it benefits the company. Uh, and you can see they were acquired in 2019 uh, at a $780 million valuation. Worked out quite well. Next slide. This, I think, uh, is a uh, pretty uh, phenomenal uh, quotation. I'm going to have to read it to you. You can read it. But this goes to show, we talk about that, that accretive um, uh, follow-on effect. This is it, right? This is how it is supposed to work. You've now shown that there's a addressable market that otherwise, uh, you know, it, it, was, um, it was impossible to tell. So investors are looking at DIU's money and DOD's money as smart money in ways they haven't ever before. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. We will always be seeking to improve. But I think this is a very concrete and very real example of what happens when it's done properly. Next slide, please. I want to give you one final example here. This is, uh, you can see the dollar value is even higher and these are sequential. This is in the AI and ML uh, uh, area. Again, the company founded in 2009. Uh, they were privately backed. This is their first time contract. They were a large but not traditional. They got a $9 million uh, prototype. And they were able to leverage that and turn that into a $95 million follow-on production contract in less than two years and transition to the Air Force. That is, again, exactly how this whole thing is supposed to work. Uh, it, it works out for everyone's benefit. And we're talking real money here. So when, we, when you think about across the innovation landscape, what I want to hammer home here is, uh, again, two things that I mentioned really to start off. One is... DIU is working. The Defense Innovation Unit constructs uh, that has been uh, in, pro in play really since 2016 in this operating format has been incredibly successful in actually doing this. We've now had uh, 21 prototypes that have transitioned. I'm just giving you a few examples here. Uh, we, our pipeline is stacked right now. We have many more that are coming through. Uh, and so there's a lot more goodness that's coming to bear. The second part of that is it's working for us, but it can also work for you. Right? We talk a lot about customer experience and how to make it easier on your behalf to work with us. Again, we have uh, three types of engagement groups uh, at the Defense Innovation Unit. Uh, the two are relevant for you today uh, is the Defense Engagement Group. That's where I run, and I'm focused on understanding that demand signal and bringing that funding in. And then there, we have a commercial engagement group, a group uh, led by Tom Faldesi, and that's really focused on the customer experience, making sure that we are reaching out to the right companies in the right sectors at the right time. And so it's as seamless as possible. So uh, we want the absolute best uh, for the men and women in uniform uh, who are defending our country. Uh, and if your technology hits that, we want to make sure that it's coming from you. So where are we going from here? Before we open up for questions, I just wanted to highlight we have a few uh, upcoming webinars. Uh, please do track on our, our site. Uh, the next one is decoding the DOD innovation alphabet. There are a lot of organizations uh, who are in this space right now. Uh, this is not a competition between DIU and AppWorks or NavalX and Ensign. We're in this together and we work in different areas. So uh, uh, my recommendation is join, that, uh, join the webinar. You can get a sense of who covers specifically uh, which area now that you understand what DIU's role is. 
if you want to uh, listen to a, po a podcast that we have coming out on the 29th, I encourage you to uh, join the, <laughs> listen to and download the uh, Tanks to Teleportation uh, podcast. And finally, when we have solicitations, you can always find them on our website. Uh, and we have the specific solicitation link that is right there. Thanks all for joining us today. Thank you.